This is how it usually happens. A trafficker, exploiting an adult or child for commercial sex, finally runs into law enforcement. And what are they charged with? Pandering or promoting prostitution. Offenses that carry lesser penalties than human trafficking, sometimes only resulting in a fine. And what happens to the victims? In many cases, they aren't recognized as such. Instead, they might be charged with prostitution or lacking specialized services, they simply disappear. Our research team from the Urban Institute's Justice Policy Center and Northeastern University's Institute on Race and Justice spent two years analyzing why so many labor and sex trafficking cases are passed over by our legal systems. This is the story of a hidden crime taking place in every corner of our country. We studied the impact of state human trafficking laws as they existed in 2007. We wanted to know if and how they were used to prosecute cases. In 2007, 19 states in the District of Columbia did not have laws against human trafficking. The good news is, today all states have anti-trafficking laws. But of course, the passage of a law doesn't guarantee that um, folks that are responsible for implementing that law are immediately aware of, of the provisions of the law and, and apply it. So when prosecutors don't make trafficking cases, the public doesn't believe it's a problem. And when communities don't think there's a problem, neither does law enforcement. And when police don't investigate cases, prosecutors are less likely to pursue trafficking charges, and the cycle perpetuates. We're here in Glover Park, which is uh, an affluent neighborhood located in Washington, D.C., about two miles from the Urban Institute, where we conduct research on human trafficking. In fact, it was here in 2006 that law enforcement, federal law enforcement, working in partnership with local law enforcement, conducted a raid at a business that was located right behind me called the OK Spa. In fact, uh, the OK Spa was not operating as a spa, but was operating as a front for sex trafficking, where women from South Korea who were smuggled into the United States and then assessed with large deaths were forced into prostitution or sex trafficking here at this location. There are a lot of challenges associated with both identifying human trafficking in communities across the country as well as bringing those cases forward through a successful investigation and prosecution. You know, um, I think there's this assumption that, that folks may have that law enforcement is out proactively looking for trafficking in all communities across the country. And so people are starting to say, well, we don't see cases of trafficking, therefore it may not exist. Um, but when law enforcement is able to uncover cases of human trafficking, um, they run into problems with building those cases. How do they can collect the types of evidence that they need to support state human trafficking laws? In some places, um, law enforcement and even prosecutors were unaware that their states even had human trafficking laws. In other places, they just felt it might be easier to charge the cases as other types of crimes because that evidence was more readily available. So often what we heard is this reliance on the victim's testimony. But because of the nature of the crime, victims often recant. Um, they may be afraid of their trafficker. They may see themselves as criminals. They may be afraid of law enforcement. 35% of all victims in our cases were arrested by law enforcement. Until law enforcement um, has the resources that they need to conduct successful investigations that support victims, um, and build evidence to support state human trafficking laws. And until local communities have specialized services, including shelter, um, that victims need to stabilize, we really are not going to see these cases being identified and we're not going to see these cases move forward to successful prosecution. Prosecutors tend to have what we call this very downstream orientation, that they make decisions about whether they'll take a case, not on whether or not they think they could get a plea bargain, which is what happens in a majority of cases, but whether or not they think a jury will convict at trial. Um, and so if they're worried that juries won't understand what trafficking is, or that juries think trafficking is something that happens in other places, or involves chains and bondage, and if those elements aren't there, they can't make a trafficking case. Um, then it's difficult for them to bring a case forward to prosecution. So we're going to have to train prosecutors about how to make those cases to jurors who don't understand the phenomena. Um, there's also um, 
sort of a reluctance that we heard across sites to use these laws because they are so new. Prosecutors may be aware of the laws, but they are, um, you know, unaware of how to, to bring those laws forward, unaware of how to prosecute cases using those laws so that those cases would ultimately result in a conviction. And so it will look like there's only a handful of cases of human trafficking, even though the majority of human trafficking cases are being funneled into other offense types. Um, so there's that sort of public perception of the problem. Uh, if you ask the question how many prosecutions there are, the answer will be that there have been very few. And there's a lot of education that's going to have to happen of judges and jurors and the community about trafficking if we want to successfully prosecute these cases. So we can't just say we only want to take the case forward to prosecution where a jury is going to clearly understand this is trafficking. Um, because those cases may be harder to find, they may be fewer, and they may not represent what trafficking looks like in the United States.